if you could um, get to your seat. We, we've had a really wonderful session uh, already today, a series of three sessions. The good news is this is the final session and we're gonna do our best to get you out of here. Uh, there are gonna be three presentations and we're followed by a 30 minute uh, panel discussion. And Rex and I are gonna do our best and we promise to get you out uh, on time. The, uh, the first presentation would be given by Vanessa Hiratsuka. Uh, she's from the Center for Human Development at the University of Alaska Anchorage. She has extensive experience in the ethical, social, and legal implications uh, of genomics research and precision medicine, especially in indigenous populations. So we're really delighted when she agreed to give this first uh, talk, which is on American Indian, Alaska Native community engagement preferences and tribal code requirements. Vanessa, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for joining us here in the room in Bethesda, as well as to those of you that are online in Zoom land and on, uh, what was it, Genome TV, I think is what I heard. It sounds so cute, that name. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to say thank you so much for having me here um, and allowing me to amplify the voices of the Alaska Native American Indian peoples that I've been working with uh, and what they've been saying about genomic medicine, about precision medicine, about genetic testing. I come to you from Anchorage, Alaska, uh, where I am a, now with the University of Alaska Anchorage, have been for the past three years. Um, before that, I was community-based and placed. I was a, a senior researcher at South Central Foundation, a tribally owned and managed uh, healthcare system. Um, and uh, what I'll be talking with you about today is largely from that time, as well as some of the work that I've been doing along with others um, at the Center for the Ethics of Indigenous Genomic Research. My pronouns are she, her, hers, um, and just a visual description for those of you that may not be able to see as well as others. Um, I'm an American Indian woman with dark brown skin, um, brown hair that now has uh, some gray in it here and there and more there and more here than I would like. Um, I'm plump. I'm wearing a uh, flower shirt that is uh, somewhat colorful and a black background. I have uh, glasses on and I'm standing in front of a podium and very nervous. Um, I would also like to do a bit of a, uh, a moment of, to acknowledge the lands of the indigenous peoples that we're on. I will massacre the names of the peoples because I'm not from these peoples. Um, and I don't think I've met anybody from these groups either, which is a shame and also part of the historic uh, trauma that indigenous peoples um, have as part of our history, but I would like to acknowledge the Anacostan and the Piscataway people um, whose lands we're on here now. Um, I am a grateful guest to be here, as are we all, I, I'm sure. Um, one of the things that I had wished to do was to just quickly describe that when, we, when I'm speaking of indigenous research, uh, I'm speaking of uh, the American Indian Alaska Native peoples. Uh, as a Navajo and Dene, so Dene is our tribal name, um, and Winnemumwintu person, um, when I fill out my demographics, for a research study, I will go ahead and mark down American Indian or indigenous or native. Um, and what that means is that I belong to a particular tribe. I am from the federally recognized tribe of the Navajo Nation. Um, and there are 574 federally recognized tribes. When I mark that down, it's often in this race ethnicity category, but it's also for American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian people, a political category. And I really wanna state that outright because much of what I'll be talking about and much what, of what our participants in our empiric research have alluded to is coming from these 574 tribal nations as sovereign nations that have the ability to and are enacting research policy as it pertains to genetic research, but also to other forms of data sovereignty. So I think that's an important context point, and I, I do wish to belabor it, um, because so much of the research and so much of the community-engaged work that is occurring amongst Native peoples, both here in the United States, where we do have that 
political designation as well as indigenous peoples worldwide is with an idea that we are at one with other human beings, but also with the spirit, the land, the cosmos, etc., And that brings us to a different set of values. Um, here in this slide, I am showing a slide from the Alaska Native Knowledge Network that's describing some univer universal values of Alaska Native people. In our state, uh, we have over 200 tribes. And uh, like any group of 200 groups of people, it's hard to find universal stuff. But this group did, and um, and I think it's important to contextualize when we're talking about peoples that we talk about the values for which they hold. And m some of what I'll be covering, uh, to use some of this language that I realize many of you are using uh, other forms of language in the way of our technical terminology as it pertains to genetics, genomics, and precision medicine. And you may less, be a little bit less inclined to your humanities. And so let me just uh, give you a reminder about a few of the things that, uh, that you might have forgotten or just put aside since you know freshman year. Of, of undergrad. Um, so I'll be speaking today about terms that are reflective of ontology, the nature of reality and of what really exists. Epistemology, relationship between the knower and what is known. Axiology, what we value. And of course, methodology, those strategies that we use to uh, determine, to justify, um, the construct of a specific type of knowledge. And I'll just say it outright, uh, the methodologies, those methods that I use in my research are both pos post-positive um, types of methods, the scientific method, but I also uh, utilize and employ within my research because it's of um, and for indigenous people, indigenous research methods. And all of this is to say that these methods, these paradigms, are uh, grounded in the principles of relation, respect, reciprocity, responsibility, resistance, resilience, resurgence, restoration, and reparation. All are words that you can use when you're doing categories. Um, but also very important principles, particularly to indigenous peoples. And, um, and so I realize with 15 minutes to you know, summarize a body of research is uh, a little bit hard, but I did want to leave you with a few of those ideas that um, what I intend to speak about is how the people that I have come to serve in Alaska, the Alaska Native leadership of those tribes, have uh, sought to create our research codes and research teams and the questions that we ask in precision medicine and in genomics research in a way that where the researchers and those being researched and those that are caring for those being researched are uh, working respectfully, ethically, sympathetically, and benevolently. And I say that because um, the way that those terms and what's elevated ethically is determined by the culture there. And uh, that's why I wanted to show terminology of universal values there in English, um, even though they come to us in, uh, in other languages. So um, again, for those of you that are not living in the world of uh, social engagement and community engagement, I had wished to put forward a, a broad definition of community engagement, um, the process of working collaboratively collaboratively um, to proactively seek out community values, concerns, and aspirations. And I deliberately use those words. Uh, proactive is what we've been asked from our tribal leaders in the Anchorage area to work on. So when there is a concept of a research project, that that ought to be brought forward and under discussion. And under discussion with whom, I think, is probably the question that many of us would ask next. Um, in the case of the Alaska Native peoples um, and many American Indian tribes, we've entered into contracts and compacts with the federal government to engage in health care services 
on, with, and behalf of our peoples. And so tribal leaders are hiring and administering and managing healthcare systems now. The healthcare system that I had worked for is one of those healthcare systems. So the stakeholders of interest are indeed those administrators that are tribal leaders, those providers within the healthcare system, and the community members. And many people that are those community members are both those enrolled, enrolled tribal members from that particular tribe in that area, or people like myself that are guests are moved there. Um, and so I am not from the area that I'm currently residing. Um, but I've been grateful to be able to be accepted there. Uh, some of the terms that we'll be discussing today are um, listed here. And I just wanted to say that these terms are influenced by community members. And again, when I say community members, I'm thinking of not just the everyday person walking around, but also the people that are wearing special badges when you go into the clinical health system as different forms of providers and support staff, as well as those leaders that have hired those providers and support staff. Um, in the health system that I worked in, we were called customer owners to further acknowledge that power relationship, not just a patient, but a customer owner, a person that owns the healthcare system and is also receiving services from it. Um, so our community context is influenced by the hopes and expectations, but also by financial resources, by job and family expectations, and by the broader social context of which we will hear more on. And when we talk about participation, I like to reflect on a, um, on a little thing that's from 1969, but it holds true now. And this is the ladder of participation that Sherry Arniston had presented in a journal article um, back in the uh, back in 69 in the journal of the American Planning Association. And um, I don't know about y'all that are in the room. I think those of you that are on Zoom and, um, and in Genome TV can see it a lot better. But here on the, uh, the ladder, the bottom rung of the ladder is, uh, has there's point one, manipulation, point two, therapy, and those two rungs are um, considered by Arniston non-participation, areas where um, it's not exactly participation in the engagement process. And then moving towards number three, informing, number four, consultation, and number five, placation. All three of these are uh, described as tokenism. And then area six, partnership, seven, delegated power, and eight, citizen control. And those are referencing citizen power. And I ask you to you know, consider thinking in these different areas as you're thinking about community engagement. If you define that community engagement as engagement of primary care providers or of another stakeholder group, I tend to think of this across stakeholder groups and triangulate between those various groups that I had mentioned. But this is just something I put forward to you. If you haven't seen it and haven't engaged with it or haven't engaged with it in a while, uh, it's a handy way of thinking about uh, participation and in aspects of engagement. So in brief, um, you know, how do we do engagement? And I think, again, this is about something that's been mentioned several times. It's that forming of trust. Um, and for the work that I've been encouraged to do and required to do by our tribal leadership via tribal codes, it's been to have active engagement of various stakeholder types in all phases of the project. I know uh, during lunch I was just talking um, and we were talking about you know who is it, who it is that I work with and now I'm at the university and I, I don't work with students, I work with community members. Um, now at a the work that I do is with individuals in the disabilities community broadly. Prior to that, I would do work with um, various members of the indigenous community as co-researchers, developing those research skills and training. So when we talk about active participation, in our tribal codes, we speak of um, conceptualization of the project as an area for active participation, the conduct of the project. Um, both in the way of how we manage the process of research, how we manage resources themselves, and by that I mean money, and how we manage conflict. So who decides what goes? 
community engagement can look like a whole lot of things. We've mentioned several of those things here. Depends on the project. Um, and I've listed here in engagement methods uh, some of those um, more post-positivistic types of uh, engagement methods. And these are several of the things that we've done through Seeger. Some of the work that I've been participating in um, in this century has been around biobanking that's owned and managed by Alaska Native people through the Alaska Area Specimen Bank. And then that led to additional work that was through an R01, uh, looking at community-engaged research methods around precision medicine, where we had conducted multiple pub public deliberations in a variety of different tribal settings. Uh, and then some survey work, as well as focus group work and interviews, um, and all with indigenous researchers um, led by, with the data owned by the uh, various tribes and tribal consortia. I've provided here a few different participatory research practices in empiric form um, and some discussion for you to look at in the future. And just a note that I wanted to um, end on in the way of a scoping review, so a literature review. Um, and this is something that my team had conducted looking broadly at uh, participatory research in American Indian Alaska Native communities. And what we had found after this thorough combing of the literature was there was, and these again are papers that were published, things people wanted to talk about publicly. Right, uh, And uh, in this, we still see that there is a need for community engagement in the early stages of the research processes, that there's an importance of guidelines um, for American Indian Alaska Native communities, more tribes in putting forward tribal code that is very specific to uh, various issues. Vanessa, could you uh, wrap up on this, please? Yes, I can. Thank you. And then the last thing that I wanted to leave you with was just some things that we each could do in our own work, regardless of who we are. Um, when you're working with tribes, to respect sovereignty. When you're working with any humans, uh, to respect self-determination. Uh, to follow the lead of the community, practice transparency, humility, to acknowledge the harms that maybe you have not caused but that exist for the people that you're working with, um, and those that may come yet, to build local capacity, make long-term commitments, and be flexible and creative. Oh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Vanessa. The next presentation will be given by Crystal Tootsie, and Crystal is an indigenous geneticist and bioethicist from the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State uh, University. And she's gonna talk about the opportunities for meaningful indigenous community engagement for population genomic screening. Crystal, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the kind invitation and welcome. Yet, thank you. Uh, hello to my people, my genetics people. I am going to do this rapid fire and I have a time um, timer to keep me at 15 minutes, but I do want to start that even with the recently expanded ACMG panel, only a handful of medically actionable genes have variant information specific to those of indigenous backgrounds. Well, how does this affect clinical utility? What does this do and what does this mean for equity? Now we've seen variations of this diagram through the wonderful GWAS diversity monitor and this other which I've circled here, has remained stagnant over the last couple of decades as it pertains to the inclusion of indigenous peoples in, in, in GWAS studies, or really any type writ large of, of genomics research. However, this is not a matter of engagement via recruitment, nor is it selling indigenous peoples on the benefits of precision medicine and health. It's a matter of overcoming mistrust, thinking more proximally about health, and empowering data decision equity. This is a, um, tells you about the structural um, inequities in terms of how healthcare is funded. Not only, this is a pre-pandemic statistic in that before, uh, in 2018, the rate of funding uh, funds to an indigenous patient was 2.4 times less compared to the dominant population. So before we sell the next 
innovations and promises of precision medicine and health, we also have to reckon that there is a severe barrier in the amount of, of promises that the federal government has long promised indigenous peoples in exchange for resources. And also we have to, um, this is a subject of a paper, that when we keep telling indigenous peoples that they're gonna miss out on precision health benefits if they don't engage, without changing the power and balances that created research harms to begin with, what we're doing is effectively engaging in a cycle of victim blaming and coercion. I also want to say that simply dropping clinical genetic tests into our communities is not going to solve the health equity problem. This is just a general, general clinical pathway of care for most rural tribal patients that want to seek genetic testing. In this case, an indigenous patient has to be referred out by their IHS provider, often located 100 plus miles away, which means that they're taking time off of work, they are driving, if they can find a car, pay for gas, get to a hotel, pay for several nights in, in that hotel just to see a provider, sometimes appointments uh, several months down the road. A question, of course, is whether or not there's a genetic counselor that's available to contextualize clinical genetic test results. At the end of the slide deck, I have a very sobering map that shows you how very few genetic counselors are available in rural areas, in rural states, in states that have indigenous communities. Are these results interpreted against that relative lack of information on indigenous-specific gene variation? What is the potential potential impact in terms of the uh, validity of the information that we're delivering. What training is available to deliver cultural specific care to indigenous gene genetic test users? Are patients being fully informed about default data sharing? And then here's an emerging question that we should all be considering. What are the risks for indigenous patients who are not covered by federal privacy laws through GINA? IHS patients and also many of our veterans, a huge portion of whom are indigenous, are not covered. This is a catch-22, actually. That it's a decision tree that many indigenous patients face when on asking the question of whether or not to contribute DNA for clin clinical genetic testing. So on the one hand, some patients might decline because they can't afford our access testing or they're concerned about data usage. On the other hand, uh, those that do agree implicitly broadly consent to any secondary data usage and data ownership by testing companies. In any scenario, this is why it's a catch-22, they derive little to no clinical utility due to lack of informative relative variants specific to their peoples. This is outside the consideration of many clinical care providers who, of course, are focused on quality of care. But by simply using a clinical genetic test, that means that clinical commercial gene testing companies can co-opt and claim ownership of indigenous people's genomic data. This is something we don't talk about enough, that this data will be deposited into public data sets like ClinVar, even if patients know to ask to opt out of dating sharing due to tribal data sovereignty rules, they don't have this option. Urban tertiary care centers that see indigenous cancer patients may also be biobanking samples and data for research under broad consent without tribal nation approval. What does this mean? in terms of taking advantage of vulnerable populations that don't have any other alternatives. What is this also should raise ethical concerns about the conflation of research consent versus the consent to care for minority, minoritized communities. There have been many studies that show that when you insert a, a, a form that consents to having your data being used for other genomic studies amidst your other forms on, on, on intake and at um, a point of care that many patients implicitly trust that white coat. Do they know what they're signing? On that topic of equity, this is something that for commer uh, commercial companies have told me as a co-founder of an indigenous-led biological and data repository called the Native Biodata Consortium. They uh, asked us when we founded this nonprofit research organization, how many indigenous patients and across what phenotypes? And we pushed back. Why don't you use our people's data and our DNA to study conditions that specifically impact us? And of this, we had a list of childhood conditions and metabolic conditions and uh, what you all as a dominant population would call rare variants. And we were told this by every single company, that it's not profit generative to use our people's DNA to create therapeutics that specifically impact us. 
So recruiting more people into data sets is not going to solve the health equity issue. Dropping genetic tests in our communities is not going to solve this issue. Using the word democratize is a false synonym for equity. When it's a system that's going to benefit most, it's going to continue to disenfranchise us as indigenous peoples. So this is something to consider when you're writing that next grant call. There are issues in terms of using population descriptors. Like all processes of gene flow and drift, indigenous peoples have had long-standing systems of kinship and relationality that are not mediated by blood, such as marrying into neighboring tribes and also adoption. And our clanship systems acknowledge this heterogeneous background under unified identity. Dina people, the Navajo people, before contact had over 400 clans. Many of these acknowledge that we acquired people from Pueblo individuals, Akama people, Zuni peoples, Mexican peoples, Mexican people, nation peoples. Yet it wasn't until 1934 that the Wheeler Howard Act was stamped upon us, imposed these racially defined population groups meant to define us and dilute our rights to these resources. But these ended up getting conflated under these eugenic notions of race. And it's a dialogue that we are constantly in consideration, um, and, and I'll bring that up in a moment. But it's very interesting because of the few data sets that are out there, these are from indigenous groups with completely distinct genetic and cultural histories from our own from those disempowered groups that probably are not even recognized by their own colonial governments in, in uh, Mexico and further south and Central and South America. And yet these are the available data sets with sometimes as few as 30 indigenous individuals meant to impute some fame, make some inferential statement about US indigenous peoples. I don't have to tell you about some of the issues with using PCAs for principal components analyses for admixed populations. Uh, for Native Americans, we are often left out because our analyses on our small data sets necessitate a different type of, of small statistical sampling procedures that are incongruent with standard QAQC pipelines. Or worse, for people that don't understand how unique our 574 plus federally recognized tribes in the US are, we get lumped into the same category which doesn't benefit anyone. It also reifies assumptions of biological purity. When we are looking for to recruit least admixed indigenous peoples, we are also ignoring the real life to live experience of other indigenous peoples in regions like the Southeast and East of individuals that have had more contact and more recent colonial settler history. It also ignores real contributions of inequities due to social and structural determinants of health. We need to rethink one person, one tribe, because we often are categorized as one tribal affiliation. Again, our populations are not stagnant, and not even since 1934. We do a disservice when we default to colonial definitions of indigeneity, do not acknowledge that peoples can belong to multiple tribes, and we do poor science. This is something that I am so grateful for, and thank you for funding this uh, recent NASA report. One thing that I am loving is this move away from genetic ancestry to genetic similarity. This type of typological move is something that I think should make transparent some of those statistical inferences that are irrelevant sometimes for our indigenous communities. But in terms of like how community members feel about genomics research and data sharing, this is actually something that was a topic of my, my own research recently because we often default to tribal leader to leader rep, uh, uh, conversations, forgetting of course that leaders are elected officials. And we don't have the longevity of office or, or the, the, the um, transmission of, of knowledge from those individuals from one administration to the next oftentimes. But those realities are consistent with community members. And I simply ask them, uh, will my genetic data be used in other studies without knowledge or consent? That was actually the top concern, even more than will the research benefit my tribe. That community members rated job and education opportunities created by health research higher than benefits of researching a, a, a disease or condition. And this is because we think in terms of seven generations. We think seven generations out. We're not thinking about our own generations. 
In terms of thinking about this pathway of innovation, we also need to think about all the other dimensions of equity to include, include data decision equity. And this is a now some article um, report on which I was a committee member. Crystal, could you please finish on this, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you. So we are now thinking about using AI and machine learning approaches through blockchain federated learning to advance data consenting and data sharing, creating our own portals that advance on group consent and broad consent through dynamic consent, thinking about metadata labeling for the labels on repositories that we don't own. But we're also thinking about building bioeconomies that are structured at all these different labels, levels of policy and governance. We also have to ask what happens to indigenous peoples outside of federally recognized uh, territories. And I just ask that when we're thinking about equity, that we're also thinking about benefit equity, as well as decision making equity on top of engagement equity. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Crystal. The third presentation will be given by Minka Lee. Minky is the Deputy Chief Engagement Officer for the NIH All of Us Research Program. And she's going to be speaking about advancing genomic research through community engagement on the All of Us Research Program. Minky. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to participate today. I've been hearing a lot of different perspectives, and I love the discussion, the active discussion going on. I'll try to address some of the points where all of us was mentioned today and um, where I think all of us could uh, provide some insight into best practices and community engagement. So the All of Us Research Program launched in 2018 nationally with the mission to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs. Um, enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. And we aim to do this by nurturing partnerships with at least one million or more uh, participants who reflect the true diversity of the United States, which we've been hearing about uh, a lot today. Um, ultimately, with that, with the data that comes from those uh, participants that they've so generously donated, we hope to deliver one of the largest, richest biomedical data sets um, that is available to researchers. So how are we doing? Uh, as of um, last week, we have reached over uh, 500,000, so half a million participants who have consented to the program, uh, consented to sharing their EHR, and also completed initial steps of the program, which includes um, a basic survey and also providing their physical measurements and biospecimen, either blood or saliva. Um, over 728,000 participants have uh, created an account, so enrolled and consented to the program. And we have over 400,000 EHR um, connected to, to the database um, in our, in our uh, platform. Um, and then diversity-wise, we are also doing uh, pretty well. While the All of Us Research Program is not solely a genomic study, it, uh, with the numbers that we have currently, it does make us one of the most diverse genomic studies um, so far. Uh, we have over 80% uh, of participants self-identifying as uh, coming from underrepresented communities in biomedical research. Our program defines those by both age, uh, race and ethnicity, uh, geography, if you're rural, or access to health care, um, disability status, sexual orientation and gender identity, um, and educational and social uh, income as well. Um, um, and then by race and ethnicity, we are almost at 50% um, by the information provided by participants. And the main contributor to how we reached this diversity really goes back to the program's intentionality from the very beginning. Um, I was lucky enough to have been a part of the program as part of the Division of Engagement before national launch, and I can contest that. We had funded and uh, we had selected and funded uh, inaugural community engagement partners even before we enrolled our very first participant into the program. So we began with um, the Asian Health Coalition, uh, PrideNet at Stanford University, the National Alliance for Hispanic Health, 50 Ford in Nashville, Tennessee, and Delta Research and Educational Foundation each had a specific uh, community 
uh, that they worked with. And since then, we have not only continued those five partnerships, but we've also expanded our engagement ecosystem to now include 18 nationally funded community partners. Um, if you count all of the subawardees through the different partners, we have over 150 partners across the country. And we know that the messenger matters, especially when you are engaging these diverse communities. So we have uh, grassroots local organizations as well as national and regional organizations, um, again, conducting various outreach and engagement activities across the country. Um, and as with the expansion, we were very mindful of certain gaps and needs and priorities of the program. Um, when these partners go out and do their work, uh, we work with them within this framework that we've developed over the years. And in our program, we define engagement as bi-directional relationships, the de development of those relationships, and also maintaining those trusted relationships. Uh, often their work, our, and our work, begins with um, outreach and awareness, again, uh, focusing on fostering trust with those participants, potential participants, and community members. We build upon those activities and go into education and increasing access to the program, uh, which I'll speak a little bit to in a few slides. Um, we focus on engagement activities that can ultimately lead to enrollment and retention in the program, but also, again, focusing on maintaining those trusted relationships with the community members and participants. For participants who have enrolled into the program, we really um, approach them as true partners. We have several community members who have identified participant uh, representatives into um, the program. We have a panel of participant ambassadors and also participant partners who are serving in various program governance committees. Um, so I know earlier we had talked about co-creation. Um, prior to the inception of the program, um, there were 17 community engagement studios across the country. One of them was with urban American Indian, um, Alaskan Native communities, and those um, community engagement studio sessions really fed into the development of the program protocol. And we've had participant ambassadors serve on the very um, first uh, steering committee meetings as well. Um, so we are very big on, on co-creation and co-development. Um, as an ultimate outcome of all of this engagement, we do focus on knowledge mobilization, where either it's the data or the research outcomes that come from participants. We want this to go back to either the participants directly or the communities that they have come from so that this benefits their communities um, in the end. So from here, I wanted to share some best practices that um, I think have worked great for, for our program and hope that um, other studies can benefit as well. Um, an example that worked from the beginning is uh, really having those partners at the table. So these partners not only go out into the communities and conduct outreach and engagement as our trusted messengers and liaisons in those communities, but they are also at the table at the program level where they are co-creating and co-developing with us. PrioNet is a great example where even, again, before the launch of the program in developing those basic um, survey questions, the questions that collected information about gender identity or a sexual orientation, sex assigned at birth, uh, PrideNet worked with us as a co-developer and helped us revise those questions and really um, perfect them for the participant that we were hoping to engage. Um, our more recent partnership with American Association on Health and Disability, uh, we worked with them to develop uh, disability-related questions in the basic survey last year, which um, went out, and those have been helping us collect disability UBR metrics. Um, and then also, we worked with AHD on a uh, communications toolkit um, for example of how fast our program works to really implement feedback from these community partners. A couple weeks ago at our program's face-to-face, -face, um, one of the per, uh, participants noted that we were missing closed captioning and they needed it for the, for the meeting. So within a few hours, we were able to get closed captioning added. And when they presented on their disability community toolkit, uh, they noted several best practices, not just being 508 compliant um, and being ADA compliant, 
uh, when you develop assets that feature a person who is disabled, that gives the that conveys the message that the event itself will be inclusive of people with disabilities, and they can often tell if the person who is in the picture is um, really disabled or if you're just putting a person in a wheelchair. So they said that true, truly being inclusive really matters a lot at all different levels. Um, and those are the kind of uh, values that we have been trying to really incorporate into our program um, at all levels, not just participant facing, but again, at the co-development and program level as well. Um, and then selecting these partners, we're also mindful of um, being culturally congruent in our engagement strategies. Uh, Delta Research and Educational Foundation is one of our partners um, who, who is doing that kind of engagement. They partner with um, HBCUs across the country. And one of their programs, uh, Delta 2020 Plus researchers, provides educational activities um, for students and network members within the sorority. So they present a speaker who comes and discusses their prospective research, um, which is aimed at improving healthcare that is relevant to the people who are attending those sessions. Um, our other partner, Asian Health Coalition, is piloting a language working group, um, which right now the program is available fully in English and Spanish. Um, and they have been advocating to add additional languages, so they're working on a pilot where they will uh, provide additional assets in the program in these five Asian languages, and that's under works right now. And they also partner with their community-based organizations, so again, partnering at different levels throughout um, the community is really important, and it has been working really well. Uh, one of the biggest barriers that I know I've heard today, and I don't think we need to mention again, is uh, transportation when it comes to participation is a big barrier um, in times of time, cost, uh, disability, various issues might just be inconvenient. Um, so one of the models that our program noted that works well is to have this mobile engagement asset. We started with one. We realized that having uh, physical measurement and biospecimen capability on board would help uh, enroll participants from rural and other areas, uh, those who didn't really have access to an enrollment site. It worked really well, so now the program has two of those vehicles. It's called the All of Us Journey. If you go on the website, you can see where it's traveling through the country. And that journey um, partners with community partners again, and they host them in these big parking lots. Uh, the picture here is the one at Stanford University with PrideNet. Um, one event that was really successful was recently, earlier this year, in Brownsville, Texas. Um, and four different partners, the Alliance um, and AHD and others, partnered to host this vehicle. And within a few days, they were able to have 150 accounts created and also almost 100 physical measurements and biospecimens collected at that one visit. Uh, the Alliance calls it the one-stop shop model, which works well for a lot of our participants um, from our UBR communities. So we've been trying to implement that and um, expand access to people through that model. And I'm gonna dwell a little bit longer on this slide than I had planned, so I hope I'm doing okay on time. Um, because I think this is the most relevant to the different population screening and return of results that I've heard throughout the day today. Uh, so the All of Us Research Program began returning health-related DNA results to our participants about a year ago now in December of 2022. Um, prior to that, we did launch return of genetic ancestry and traits results in 2020. Um, so as of last month, we now have offered uh, genetic ancestry and traits, uh, hereditary disc disease risk uh, results, which test the um, 59 genes of the ACMG panel, and then also pharmacogenomics results, which test the uh, results of seven genes. Um, we've offered each of these results to over 180,000 participants, and you can see how many have viewed their results here. Um, and as of now, we are offering health-related DNA results to about 5,000 participants per week. And while we still have more work to do um, in expansion and also providing an equitable results experience to all eligible participants, I do want to note that um, 
est we estimate based on the results that we are returning in terms of the hereditary disease risk reports that about 3%, so I think 2.9% of participants may receive um, pathogenic or likely pathogenic results. Um, and that when we reach a million, that translates into almost 30,000 participants re receiving actionable results. Um, the program does provide clinical validation testing as a follow-up to those participants who do receive pathogenic or likely pathogenic results. And that is actually an outcome of um, a series of listening sessions that we held with our participant ambassadors and community partners very early on in the planning stages of genetic-related return of results, where we heard from our community partners and participants and consortium members that, you know, people without health care or lack um, of resources, the results can be um, very burdensome. Um, so clinical validation testing was added on in response to that feedback. Um, so that's something that um, we really are, uh, for at least from the Division of Engagement, we were really proud of that we were able to re achieve that outcome. And then all, um, all of us participants have access to our Genetic Counseling Resource Center. So they can go into the participant portal and schedule a uh, phone conversation with a genetic counselor. Um, it's, they, you can also request a interpreter in two, over 200 different languages. Um, and you don't need to have a specific result to request those sessions. So that's also available as a resource. Thank you. Could you sum up in about a minute, please? Yep, I'm almost done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we also recognize the importance of diversity on both ends of research. So when the um, data platform for the All of Us research program launched in 2020, we recognized that we also wanted to have a community of diverse researchers using the data. Um, so we've put forth efforts to, um, in, to help that happen. Um, you can see the number of researchers currently registered as users, and we currently have 97 um, minority-serving institutions uh, registered with a data use agreement. Um, our division also supports a lot of you know, researcher engagement work to support that, recognizing that there is um, capacity building efforts and things like that that are required for researchers to use our data platform. Um, PrideNet held a researcher boot, uh, base camp earlier this year. We have a partner at Baylor College of Medicine who hosts um, annual faculty summits. It's a three-day workshop essentially training people to use the workbench, but also providing mentoring and um, support for like grant application writing, things like that. Um, and they follow through for the whole year with these research teams to ensure that they um, are getting what they need in terms of support to use the workbench. Um, and then we have one other partner, uh, University of Utah, who hosts uh, high school student, uh, high school teachers uh, every summer to come and use, learn how to use the workbench and learn about the program. And these are just highlights. I'm happy to talk to you more about um, other partners as well. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minky. We're now going to move directly to our panel session, and I'll call on my twin brother, Rex, to take it away. <laughs> Thanks, twin brother. So um, we've heard three really interesting presentations, and I want to make sure everybody writes down the questions that they have relative to these three presentations, because we will be including them in the discussion after we have, have the panel. Um, and I, I did want to recognize, uh, actually, that our, our, the title is fairly uninspired for this panel, and so I want to thank uh, Caitlin for suggesting a potential alternative title. Uh, too late to get into the booklet, of course, but beyond actionability, uh, discussing the who, what, when, and why of expanding population screening to new conditions. So uh, maybe that's a better title for us to think about going forward. So I would invite our four panelists who are Caitlin Allen, Ned Kalange, Jessica Hunter, and Bob McNellis to go up to the uh, front, where we're going to actually use the panel chairs that have been there all day long. And uh, what we're going to do is I, we've asked each of the panelists to, in two to three minutes, and we're going to try to keep them to that, 
um, to just make an opening comment about how they think about expanding population screening to new conditions, and I should say also to new communities. Um, and we'll start with Caitlin and just go in alphabetical order. And then once we've had uh, the initial comments, then we'll have an opportunity for some uh, discussion about the points that emerge from that. And then we'll open it up to the floor and the folks online. So Caitlin. Thank you. So um, we at uh, Med Medical University of South Carolina have uh, recently, as of 2021, November 2021, implemented a population-wide genomic screening program. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this was um, a decision that we ultimately made was, was that we would do this as a research protocol as opposed to um, clinical care. And our goal is to enroll 100,000 individuals into the program. Um, and we're at 35,000 participants so far um, over the course of about two years. We do whole exome sequencing, um, and we are working with Helix as our laboratory partner. So they're CLIA certified, um, and all of the results for this program are returned into the EHR, and we also provide free genetic counseling for all positive individuals. So I'm saying that to just kind of lay the groundwork for where we are and how we, I'll, I'll let you know kind of how we got there, and um, to Rex's point about future expansion. So currently, um, we're, we're looking at, um, or we're screening all adults in South Carolina. We are doing this, uh, we're returning tier one conditions um, and the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, Lynch syndrome and familial hypoclostrolemia. And we did this, um, made this decision as an institution because these were well vetted CDC tier one conditions. Um, they're considered actionable, all the reasons we've sort of talked about today, but that was something that leadership felt comfortable with um, moving forward with the CDC tier one conditions as our, our package. Um, and then considerations that we had early on are a lot of what we talk, have been talking about today. So um, ensuring that um, participants are understanding their findings, both positive and negative results. Um, we're making, really trying to make sure that um, we're be able to connect individuals to clinical care and being able to then ultimately track those downstream clinical outcomes. So future expansion um, that we have in mind but have not done are actually thinking about pediatric populations um, and potentially expanding to um, provide this type of free screening service for, um, for our pediatric population, um, prioritizing more rare conditions. We're also thinking about um, and actively expanding in the pharmacogenomic space. Um, and so returning results with, for genes that are associated with um, our priorities as, as far as pharmacogenomics goes, um, as well as returning secondary findings, um, in particular APOL1, PKD1, PKD2. And part of the reasons for, for focusing on those particular genes is um, because of our state's sociodemographic and, and sort of health um, concerns with kidney disease, uh, morbidity, as well as uh, disparities in that space. Uh, and then I think other considerations as, as we're thinking about expanding are um, that we, we have this under a research protocol, which is uh, great in a lot of ways. That allows for us to recontact individuals who've participated, but we ultimately would need to reconsent them to provide them with additional findings. Um, and then we're also thinking about just what the right combination of um, considerations are for, um, for, for expanding and looking at ClinGen guidance to help us um, uh, think through that. Th thanks, Caitlin. Uh, next, we can move to Ned. Uh, do you want to give your introductory comment? <clears throat> Hi. Um, <clears throat> so, I have kind of three things to talk about, EBM old, EBM new, research, and equity. So um, there are evidence-based method, uh, evidence-based medicine methods that have resulted in recommendations for genetic screening <clears throat> on a population-based level. So recognize that the USPSTF does that. Their recommendations are population-based recommendations to be offered to everyone in the groups 
that are identified for benefit versus harms. And they have one uh, recommendation around genetic screening, which I participated in years ago, and they're re-looking at it even as we talk today, which was uh, BRCA1 and 2. So I think uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer screening has a footprint with evidence base behind it, and there was a method that got the task force there. Then the EGAP working group uh, did its work, and from those, well, I was there as well, we came up with uh, the other tier two, tier one uh, tests, Lynch syndrome and familial hypercholesterolemia. Then I retired from genetics for 12 years. 12 years later, we have three conditions <laughs> in tier one. And I'm just a little amazed. And that, so that tells me it's time to rethink about the methodology <clears throat> to kind of look at what Mike wants to do and look at what Les was talking about and saying, we're not talking about lowering the bar. We're talking about criteria that would help us get the evidence necessary to add additional tier one tests when we start to think about population-based screening. So what I heard from Mike and I heard from Les were kind of where the uncertainties are. And can we identify those uncertainties and get a, a, a set of tests that are almost ready for prime time? That is, we can specifically identify what gaps would have to be filled in to get us closer to meeting those bars of either the EGAP working group or the USPSTF, and therefore provide additional tests that have that kind of, sorry, we used to say that at the clinical guide, that kind of bulletproof recommendation that you know if you do this, people are going to have better health. So those are those issues. How does that relate to research? I'm glad North Carolina is doing that. I would make a slightly different recommendation. South, South Carolina. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Remember, I'm from Colorado. And <laughs> totally different world. <laughs> and I know the Mississippi is between us, so that's about it. I think the other approach is to think about funding integrated healthcare systems to pilot these. So we do this, well, we don't pay for it, but we do it in newborn screening in order to get consider, consider is, to be considered to be added to the routine uniform screening panel, there has to be a pilot study that's identified at least one case. Uh, and, and CDC maybe pays for that every now and then, and NIH maybe pays for it every now and then. But thinking about uh, taking on a Geisinger or a Henry Ford or a Kaiser Permanente, and I, I don't mean to leave anybody out, Inner, Inner Mountain, there's three or four others, I know, Loveless, that are integrated healthcare systems who would be a great setting for saying, we're going to have a pilot of a population-based test for genetics. So um, Terry and well, Eric's gone, but if you're thinking about things that you could actually um, screen, I'm sorry, fund that might end in moving the bar a little forward towards new conditions being on the, uh, the tier one. That's just a strategy I think about. Then finally, we were reminded so well by the articulate and amazing speakers in this last session that there is this incredible opportunity to make recommendations that increase inequities through genetic testing. And so all of the work we do needs to have the component of community engagement and the lens of how can we do this in a way that does not increase health inequities. So those are my comments. Thanks very much. Jessica Hunter is up next. Yeah, so I've been coming at population screening from the context of ClinGen. So I lead the actionability work where we're doing evidence-based assessments of actionability, generating reports that summarize actionability of gene condition pairs. We score for factors associated with actionability, how severe the outcome is, how effective the intervention is, the nature of the intervention to the patient, and how likely the outcome is to occur, um, aka penetrance. 
Um, and all of the scores, these uh, semi-quantitative uh, scores, and our final uh, actionability assertion um, are available on the website. Um, we've developed this framework um, in the context of secondary findings, which is why most of the domains are based on the individual. Um, but we're recently shifting to more population-wide, and we've been adapting this framework for the context of um, polygenic risk scores and now uh, shifting um, as well as to population screening and thinking about as part of that effort, what factors need to be added to this framework um, in order to account for a population wide impact. Um, you know, severity at that point, it's not just severity in the individual, but you know, how impactful is this condition to the po at the population level and um, those kinds of things. Um, and so, yeah, we're beginning to think of what factors we need to include in that framework, um, a lot of which we've, we've learned through the polygenic risk score um, effort. Um, but for, oop, that's a weird echo. Uh, but for uh, community engagement, I will say that we have found this effort to be quite, um, sorry, that's a little distracting. Somebody logged in. Someone yeah, might have. Please mute their computer. Oh, leave the audio uh, component if you're online. Um, so we have engaged in uh, community engagement as part of our effort, um, which we have found very valuable. Um, you know, there's a certain domains that are more subjective than others, like the nature of the intervention, um, you know, the risk and burden to the patient, you know, is how we see it as clinicians and researchers different than the patient? And is it different between patients who have had the intervention versus patients who haven't? Um, and so we've done a lot of that community engagement to essentially make sure that how we're measuring these domains is how the people that we want to benefit from what we're doing um, would measure those domains. And so that's been really um, helpful. As well as for particular topics, we've done community engagement. Um, and an example is uh, prelingual deafness. Uh, we engaged, uh, uh, we did some community engagement with the deaf community um, to think about how to phrase our terminology. We found a lot of the evidence we found um, used terms that weren't. Uh, along the lines of what the deaf community would use. And so we use that to essentially um, make sure our reports were um, inclusive um, and included non-clinical interventions that were suggested to us through that community engagement. And so it's been a very important effort. Okay, and uh, last but not least is Bob McNellis. Great, thank you, Rex. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. And forgive me, I'm just recovering from a cold, so my voice is a little smoker's cough, it feels like. Um, uh, I'm from the Office of Disease Prevention at the National Institutes of Health, and unlike many of you, I don't speak genomics as well as you do, um, but I do speak prevention. And I was actually quite uh, inspired by Les's talk this morning about that uh, genomics does, is not an exceptionalism. There's no exceptionalism there with regard to prevention. The Bayesian theorems still apply um, uh, to, to all of the work that you do. At ODP, what we're interested in is sort of assessing and facilitating and stimulating prevention research across the 27 institutes and centers at NIH. We do that uh, partially through developing and coordinating and then implementing some of those prevention programs. <clears throat> We work closely with the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and the Community Preventive Services Task Force and Healthy People to really identify key evidence gaps in prevention. And I think there's some other opportunities here uh, to work with all of you to identify some of the key evidence gaps that might exist as you think about population screening. Um, for us, I know as we look across our prevention portfolio across NIH, um, of all the prevention research, about a third of it actually looks at leading um, risk, risk factors. About a ninth of that prevention research actually tests a randomized intervention for that um, uh, leading risk factor, and about a twentieth of that actually tests that randomized intervention for a leading risk factor in a health disparate population. So really very small representation of health disparate populations, uh, even in traditional, or, or should I say, um, just our run of the mill prevention, prevention research. I think that provides us some opportunities. We've you know, added um, a whole area of 
our strategic work that involves advancing um, research in health disparate populations. Um, and really, I think the important thing that we can offer is ways to understand and address research gaps. And I heard a lot of research gaps today. And I think I can offer a couple of reflections on that a little bit later. But just to let you know, uh, one other sort of interest that I have is implementation of this work. And we heard a lot today about how it's going to fall on primary care clinicians. Um, we've got a little bit of experience with that. I'm reflecting back. Um, not quite 12 years ago, uh, but 2000, 2005, the American Academy of Family Physicians held its, uh, its educational focus on genomics to try to help family physicians embrace uh, the era of genomics. I think here we are 18 years later, and I'm not quite sure AAFP has, our family physicians in general have embraced it at quite the level that they might have hoped. So I think we do have some work there, um, but I think there's lots of opportunities too. So with that, I'll stop and look forward to the discussion. Okay, so b before we open it up to general questions, I, I wonder if each of you could just take a minute or so and comment about what aspects of community engagement you've used in you starting up your projects and how you do that in an ongoing way to make sure that your work is continuing to be relevant to the communities that you're uh, doing your research in. I should say in partnership with. So for our work at MUSC, we um, developed our own community advisory board. Um, so there were existing patient family advisory councils that the um, unit that the hospital has in place, and um, we felt it was we felt strongly that we needed to have our own community advisory board for the specifically for this project. Um, when trying to identify people that were going to be part of the community advisory board, we were very intentional about um, representation from across the state of South Carolina. So MUSC is in Charleston um, and mostly as a footprint there, but our screening program is designed for the entire state. So we really wanted representation from across the state. We also wanted to find folks that um, would have different, differing perspectives about genomics and screening, and um, not all of our community advisory board members agree or that they have varying opinions, and that was intentional. Um, and so that's been that's been important for our work, um, as well as the community, the engagement of our um, clinicians early on and some of the co-creation and decision making we had about how to just set up the program. I guess I'll talk from my role um, with the state health department and say that as we put together programs uh, now that are designed to improve delivery of care in um, historically marginalized communities, we make sure, first of all, that our advisory committee includes a diverse group of individuals with lived experiences beyond that of the people that work in the health department or those uh, that are members of, of the white um, supremacy uh, majority that still makes up our state. So um, I think that outreach and inclusion is important. And then the next step is as you design a program, even with that representation, to take it into communities to a broader discussion uh, with more people who have lived experiences different from the ones on your communities so that you make sure you have enough input to tailor the delivery of a program that's going to be most successful for a given community. Well, and I, I touched on this a little bit already in, in getting community engagement on kind of validation of, of our metric. Um, and I think that will be particularly important as we move forward towards population screening. Um, but for our individual reports, that's been a bit more ad hoc um, on when a little red flag pops up, then maybe uh, this is an important report to get feedback on. But I think uh, perhaps going forward, we need to be a bit more systematic about that. And I think that would be a really important addition to our efforts. Great, thanks. And I'm not speaking for ODP because I'm not sure we engage the public in quite the same way, but um, uh, coming off a couple of experiences that I've had recently with um, in some research areas, 
Um, I know Colorado actually has, University of Colorado has, has you're thinking of the boot camp. Yep. yep. Um, really good results. There's a team at University of Colorado that engages patients in development of educational materials. And they found better uptake of whether whatever the intervention was, whether it was blood pressure screening, cholesterol, um, whatever it was, getting patients directly engaged in developing the educational materials that are used is an effective way to help engage patients and then help improve the educational process. The second one is um, uh, from the organizational standpoint, and I'm not quite sure what ACMG's approach is, but there are other groups that actually uh, at professional meetings bring together patient um, clinician or patient researcher pairs, dyads, to help make sure that the patient uh, perspective is represented in every aspect of the work, not just as somebody to come in and just get their perspective, but actually fully engaged in the work. And that also seems to be a very effective way to keep people in line, not in line, but um, uh, engaged in, in, in every, along every step of the way. Thank you very much. So um, we heard a really nice description from Minky about how all of us has reached out and engaged uh, communities. I'd be very interested to hear from uh, Vanessa and Crystal how uh, that might look if we thought about engaging uh, your communities. I, I was really struck by the fact, uh, Crystal, that you said that only five ACMG medical action, medically actionable genes were even relevant. Um, how do we do a better job? There's two questions there, <laughs> first of all. I want to highlight something really important and I'm actually on the Indigenous Research Working Group for the All of Us Research Team. That's where I stepped out about an hour ago, and I had this exact conversation that there is a distinct difference between engagement versus research capacity and training. Now, they can be part of the same spectrum, but they are two polar opposite sides of, the same, of that spectrum. You cannot use one versus the other. So when we're going into talking with community members and tribal leaders, uh, we cannot say, oh, well, we're training students, checkbox engagement, that is a completely separate activity than what we're calling for, which is the more difficult activities related to conversations that are difficult, building trust, uh, good qualitative research, and not just surveys and focus groups at democratic deliberations. And, and uh, Vanessa has given us a couple of great examples, several great examples, Seeger, um, that we have trialed in our communities as well. So I just want to have those two distinctions. The other part about like the medically actionable genes. Yes, so of those, um, those are mostly centralized on colorectal cancer, gene variants are especially related. And, and there's a recent report that stated that that is now the number one cancer in our communities. Um, and so there's obviously a, a point of intervention here, but there's also a lot of concerns. So in terms of when we refer an IHS patient out, what tests are we giving them? Is it relevant? How are those test results being um, returned back to the community? Um, are they validated in a research setting versus a clear certified setting? I know it's not usually a concern for most institutions, but it is a concern for institutions that are smaller and that are community held. Uh, so there's a, uh, a thing of scale here, but then also what does that mean for meaning for one community versus another, right? Um, and there's just a lot of concerns about GINA, a lot of concerns about harmonization of data. The other definition that I wanted to just state is that we're, we're, we're talking about um, population screening um, in like research domains and then public health domains, but those two spheres are separate in terms of their ethics and in terms of their regulations and in terms of how those are sanctioned. So, and, and especially at the tribal IRB, RRB realm, I mean, the, there are rules and uh, mo like past practices for engaging with tribal IRBs when they're recognized by uh, the NIH, because under the common rule and single IRB mandate, they're not always recognized. There's only like three, 33 of them. RRBs are not recognized. Other forms of, um, of uh, tribal research governance are not recognized, but when we're talking about public health now, that's an entirely different animal. We're talking about d different federal agencies. We're talking about different uh, legal proceedings should something go wrong. And then how the IHS and pathways of care, especially even for, you know, we're not just talking about 
ur rural tribal settings, there's also separate considerations for urban individuals of which, according to the last census, now 80% of indigenous uh, peoples that of AIAN communities now reside in urban areas. There's a lot of issues here, so sorry. I just want to unpack that. Crystal, can I, I'm gonna put you on, on, on the spot. Crystal's a great follow on X, by the way, um, formerly known as Twitter. But you said you had a post earlier today, not from this meeting, but about from another meeting about indigenous leadership. And I think that was, you didn't quite go there, I thought you might, but I'd, I'd be really interested in your thoughts about leadership of research as opposed to partnership in research. I'm gonna point it back to you. Can you clarify a little bit more? So you basically said that um, for a particular proposal that it was um, discussing indigenous leadership uh, within the proposal, and the proposals reflected engagement, but not leadership. And so that seems a, a, a different level of engagement, and you, you, you were starting to get there, but you didn't quite get there, and I think you have some thoughts that would be important as we think about the research agenda. I have a lot of thoughts. Um, <laughs> Okay, well, right now we're presuming research from a very, uh, our common pathway of these are research proposals initiated by individuals with PhDs working in academic centers and then they're reaching out to, to communities. Um, and, and, and even the word partnership is either thrown around really loosely and it's not really respected in the same way in terms of resource development. Uh, the post that I, I mentioned earlier or wrote earlier was something to the effect of we can no longer call things indigenous led when institutions have 57% indirects or, sorry, Hopkins, like near 100% indirects. And um, those go to um, uh, PIs when most of the grassroots activities are actually from community members themselves. And they're the ones that are generating the data, the protocols going through all the approval processes, and they get a tiny fraction of that. And this is something that we need to consider for the NIH models. Now, NIH has been really great in the last two years, you've started to really consider that you do not need to have a, a, a terminal PhD status, which is important when you consider that the uh, Seattle Indian Health Board director, who, who just stepped down recently, is a master's level investigator. So this meant that for individuals like her, myself, Joseph Irsheta, who's the executive director of the Native Biodata Consortium, who were a me recently master's level, we couldn't even be PIs of our own research. Uh, so, and also, uh, what that meant is in terms of contracting with, with universities, we were always um, having to have our lawyers step in, which we have lawyers, thank God, but that took a long time. And that's the first time and not the last time I'll say thank God for lawyers. But <laughs> with the single IRB mandate, um, which has, you know, and the common rule, which has language about respecting tribal safety, uh, was, uh, tribal sovereignty. Um, that only means for tribes that have an IRB that has an FWA, which is like a small, small fraction of the 574 recognized tribes. Of those, then, you know, you could still work with a, a you know, large name institutions that just happen to have ex, um, in institutional um, um, standards of refusing to cede review to external IRBs to include tribal IRBs. Um, so, like, how do we win? Even if we wanted to partner with, with universities, we are constantly at the wrong end of that decision-making equity and power and authority. And there's something to be said of that the distinctions between respecting versus operationalizing indigenous data sovereignty. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to make sure, Vanessa, you had a chance. Oh, uh, just to um, ask about the question of what do we need to do a better job? How do we need to think about uh, different ways of thinking? We've heard some great ideas already about um, helping address the uh, inequity that we have inherently with indigenous people. Well, first off, I don't believe that the inequity that um, the American government has with indigenous people is uh, alone to indigenous people. I think we're talking about historic inequities with many, many groups of people. Uh, and, and so there are some concepts um, that 
ought to be considered, um, and which is exactly why I put together that I highlighted that ladder of, um, of collaboration, of, of engagement. Um, at the very least, we should start attempting to climb such a ladder, um, recognize that that ladder exists. Um, and then when we move forward uh, on our work, be it as an individual or as a system, that we move up it. I think one of the things that, you know, I was hearing from Dr. Lee was, um, you know, in in the example of an individual with disability that is being highlighted on uh, something as simple as a flyer, that indeed the community will recognize if a person is an able-bodied person that is uh, a model that's sitting in a wheelchair versus a, a individual that has had that full lived experience. As a for instance, which is um, a tokenism, right, straight up. Um, and also the uh, material wealth of uh, being part of the the research is not being shared then with a member of the disabilities community, right, as an actor or as a, a model for that group. Indeed, it also precludes any individual or member of a group, leader, however we wish to say it, from having their voice at that table and being able to describe and discuss what they see as being uh, a uh, the face um, and name and body for, for such research. So again, I go back to these concepts of participation um, and really thinking long and hard what Good it means when we are uh, indeed uh, working with others and what our intentions are and being very clear um, and determined in those intentions. Rex. There is a question online that may be relevant to maybe if um, Vanessa and Crystal could uh, briefly address it. And the question I wanted to know, all of the presentations have significance to oppressed communities that are not federally recognized. So how can the nuances and the experiences that you've mentioned, particularly for American Indian and Alaska Native research experts and the concern for respect, how can all of these be extended to the other underrepresented um, minoritized groups and also the ones not federally recognized. Can I just confirm, I, we got a note that the folks online are not getting sound. Is that still correct? They're getting sound. Okay, thank you. Sorry, George. Either of you, I think what you just addressed relates to that and you could briefly summarize for us. So, oh, you want me to rephrase the question? Okay. It's really interesting. We talk about biology in terms of distinctiveness across populations, like or between and within, but then we don't even talk about relationality in terms of, of how, like in terms of respect of our kins. And, our, and, and I think this is really important because you know, we have federally recognized tribal nations, but we don't acknowledge their cousins, their neighbors, their, 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 and uh, which have distinct and different types of historic harms. But we, we try to legislate across genomes, and genomes don't care. Uh, so this is where I think, in terms of the principles that Vanessa brought up, in terms of, of thinking in terms of respect and humility, but also extending that to how we are thinking and globally and ethically. So I would just like to add that one of the uh, things that I uh, hold to with the work that I've been able to do is uh, the role of sovereignty and how our tribal nations are able to force the issue of uh, of the research codes, of the meaning behind those research codes. And other marginalized groups don't have that opportunity. Uh, and so it doesn't mean that they don't have similar values, that they don't have similar desires to be included in research, to drive the research, to have uh, power sharing, to be um, all of, to do oh so many things, all of those R's that I rattled off earlier. Um, Tribal nations instead have that political authority to engage in uh, in tribal consultation, right? 
one of the things that I had the blessing of being part of was developing the tribal consultation policy for the NIH. Um, that's not something that other marginalized groups get to have because there is no uh, authority to do that. It doesn't mean that there's not the moral imperative for all of us to follow through on such things. Um, and so that's where my mind goes, uh, is that we have a uh, responsibility to our various marginalized communities to inquire in the same manner, be it required or not, uh, when we are engaging and seek to engage in whatever type of work. Even in the absence of a legal, yes. um, no, that's, that's great, thank you. So I think we'd like to open it up for a broader discussion, so um, go, go ahead. <clears throat> so I think one of the kind of underpinnings of dissemination and implementation research is that we wish to make the fruits of research as broadly disseminated as possible. Um, and so, and, and that's a little bit different than thinking along the lines of basic science research, right? But it's engaging with communities and it's sort of finding ways to make something work, right? And so do you see a difference in the way that engagement should happen say, let's say in my state of North Carolina, we do have um, Native American populations. And, you know, if we wanted to say, let's, let's have a statewide effort to do this genomic screening because we think it's useful. So how do we go about doing that with the patchwork of constituencies that we would want to engage with? What's the best way to do that? Yeah, if I could go ahead and start the response. Um, one of the slides that I glossed over quite quickly as I frantically pushed the forward button was uh, a slide that I uh, had to deal with a newborn screening. Um, and in Alaska, we one of the uh, secondary additions to newborn screening was a um, in, what was it, 2003, 2006, somewhere around there, was a CPT1A Arctic variant. And um, the addition of that variant as well as uh, materials that were developed um, for the public, that those that had screened positive, those were developed by, between the state of Alaska as well as the Alaska Tribal Health System, and they were directed to uh, providers of care for um, Alaska Native people that were within the Alaska Tribal Health System. Alaska Tribal Health System uh, is, uh, again, managed by Alaska Native people and is uh, caring for about 40% of the state population when we look at uh, managed care and clinical care there. Uh, kind of sticky thing there is that the materials are being mailed out when a person has a positive. Um, it's a CD, like a, a DVD. Hasn't changed in all these years. Um, and it, it's not something that was, those materials, those patient education materials, hadn't been tested with uh, everyday people that were receiving them, but instead were to inform the providers of care for those individuals. Uh, it wasn't until a couple years ago that um, the health system had uh, put together a research project that was NIH funded to, in, to do some community-based um, inquiry, both with the current providers as well as with the uh, the patient population, particularly those that had received such things in the mail and had received um, information that uh, their child had this particular variant um, in a double whammy sort of way, right? Uh, <laughs> and these focus groups had indicated that indeed the people had and the providers still had a lot of questions and the materials weren't quite as helpful as uh, as we had all in public health had hoped they would be. Um, I say that little story here uh, because there are procedures that we can all think of now after the fact of what could have been done, coulda, woulda, shoulda, um, in the way of engaging with individuals, um, with parents that are receiving this information ahead of time and developing it. I mean, goodness, even the title of the materials is something around the lines of, um, it's, there's not only one energy crisis in regards to the metabolism um, issues. Yeah, it's, 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 got, it's a hot mess, I think, personally, in the way of the materials. But um, anyway, I, I use that as a, a little case study in the way of what could be done different in the for community engagement on something that is highly specific to an indigenous population, an Inuit population, not just here in the United States, but other Inuit populations where that 
is there. So we've got four hands up. Um, and, there, and there's one hand on the line. Yeah, I saw that one. Uh, so Mark, Pat, George, and Bruce. And if anybody else wants to see the line, make sure you get your card up. But Mark, you're up. Thank you. Um, this is to the panel, though. Um, it, the handicap here is that uh, the, my question is about somebody that's not represented at the meeting. And that is, we're talking about engagement. Um, and um, there's one entity that is uh, has been specifically mandated to do patient-centered outcomes research, that is PCORI. Um, they also have a mandate related to rare disease, which they've had a real challenge uh, meeting their uh, expenditure uh, in the rare disease space. And it seems like there's some opportunities there, particularly since um, they've developed a whole set of methodologies for uh, engagement research. And so for, for any of you on the panel or Alana, who I know has done a lot of work with Macquarie, that could comment on uh, whether there could be some opportunities for engagement with uh, PCORI in this space, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Yes. Yeah, no, it's... Uh, I, uh, could, could, you, could, could you elaborate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I cough when I laugh. Um, Pecori is great. I mean, and they have now years of experience doing this kind of engagement work. I think they're a great target for us to work with. We've worked with them on, on a couple of different projects, and they bring, a, I think, a unique perspective to it. They build a, uh, you know, a patient advisory group with each project as it comes along. I think there's some real models there we might be able to tap into and use. So I think that's a terrific idea. And you're right. I wish um, I'd thought of that earlier too to mention it. Alana. Yeah, I just want to add to that too. I think um, we have seen some, I mean, the fact that, that we're talking about this here and as a grant reviewer, both for PCORI and for NIH over the years, um, I've seen some of, a lot of the PCORI thinking move its way into the NIH grant review process. We're like, hey, they, they didn't include there is no engagement at all in here in an NIH grant, you know. So um, I think there that yes, there there's definitely we can do more, um, but I think there is a little bit, and I think just what we've seen here and that we're talking about it is the right steps. And I'll let the questions continue. So Pat, I think you're next. Okay, um, yes, my, my question's for Minky. I had a question about the All of Us Research Program. So I thought you did a great job of giving us a, a really good overview of the diverse engagement efforts that All of Us has uh, pursued. And then I was um, personally just interested in the, the last slide that you showed that said for both hereditary cancer and pharmacogenomic um, variants, that only about half of the participants viewed the results. So my question is, was that in line with your expectations? And do you have any under, uh, have you explored um, the reasons that half, only half have, have chosen to view the results? No, it, it wasn't, especially since um, it was a long time coming. So a lot of our participants had voiced that they were waiting for it, that it was taking too long. Um, so we definitely expected a higher percentage of participants to view their results, especially with all the support that came with it in terms of genetic counselors. And um, the reports themselves also look very nice. They're vi visually appealing. We had a lot of community partners review the language on them. It comes with information on the gene and then um, just ways to understand the information better. Um, we The team is looking into how to increase that. Um, but yeah, right now, it, that's, that's where it seems to be. and. Um, for some of the participants, if we anticipate a pathogenic or likely pathogenic, sometimes we do, um, they, those are the cases where we do require them to um, set up a meeting with a counselor in order to receive their results. So that might be an additional threshold um, in viewing their results. But um, overall, the once they do have a consultation with the counselor, the uh, satisfaction score is very high. It's around 60%. So it, we don't think it's a, something to do with the experience itself, but something else must be um, in action there. And we, we are having to look into it. It has been less than a year. So 
um, maybe it'll just take more time. I'll just make a quick comment that that percentage is actually higher than people see with biobank return of results. Um, I, we were just discussing, like, for both Penn and Geisinger, that's 50 percent is actually much higher than we see with trying to return biobank results and whether people respond to that. We do acknowledge it is high. Yeah, it's clinical. Uh, Bruce. Yes, thank you. Um, this is actually a somewhat technical question, I guess, for Crystal, and that is, um, you mentioned the use of blockchain, and the very, very, very little bit I understand about blockchain has always made me wonder if it's a way for people to control their genomic information so that they can share it when they want and with whom they want. And I'm wondering, first of all, if, is that accurate? Is that how you're using it? And then, if so, is, that, is it scalable and could it help to get us out of the quandary where we have genomic data frequently kind of locked in place, like with an academic medical center, for example, where it isn't easy to uh, port, it, port it to other settings? Yeah, so blockchaining is more at the infrastructure level. Um, there is smarter people that work in data uh, systems around the table. But basically, um, first I would say that dynamic consenting is something that provides an individual level of, of sort of deci de decision as to, to whom uh, somebody might consent to have their data shared, what types of data they are willing to share, what like rules in terms of like data dissolution, like do ha are there cultural rules that they would prefer to enact that they want to remove their data or draw down their data, and you can employ dynamic consenting models actually um, at the the earlier design. So I think that UK Biobank employs this type of um, approach. This is also an approach that we developed at the Native Biodata Consortium as part of our infrastructure so that we can license it to other tribal nations worldwide for free. Um, the, the thing about blockchaining is, and it's very important here, is um, you can sort of um, define different types of user um, access, read uh, rules, um, but those type of levers are usually done um, by whomever is designing it, right? But, and, and then and again, I'm speaking more from a community-centered approach, um, you can actually have community members act as the authority nodes for deciding who gets access to certain types of data, under what conditions, what study types, et cetera with in partnership with tribal nations. So sometimes we, this is like uh, positioned as an individual versus group consent. Speaking to an author of a great paper here that um, uh, interviewed tribal leaders and they say, and one of the leaders and elders, or was it a leader and elder? Both, okay. Uh, that stated it's not individual or group, it's both. And it's actually, up to tribal nations to decide how they're going to make those decisions, not outsiders. But in terms of how tribal nations can govern, you can have both an individual level of, of, of control and um, uh, as well as that tribal nation control. Blockchaining is one way. Another way is federated approaches where you can actually um, like read and maybe even execute without having like full access to all of the data within independent nodes that are governed and housed by communities. And this is something that um, many other systems are employing as well. Uh, I can't tell, is it Alana or Kate that has their card up? Go ahead. Um, I, I made my comment earlier that, oh, okay. that, Sorry. The, um, okay. that, that like return of results was just like 50% is pretty high. Uh, Chrissy? <clears throat> Yeah, I had a follow-up question for Mickey Young. Um, so I think you mentioned from your presentation that um, genetic counseling was offered to all of us participants, even if they did not have their results returned. So wondering what kind of uptake you got on that and, and what were their questions, if, if, you, if you know that. Yeah, um, 
I'm thinking. The only information I took away from that um, in preparation for this talk was that the CSAT scores were high, the satisfaction scores were about 60%. The specific questions, I would have to look into that in terms of what they're asking. Um, yeah, I don't have the, the feedback off hand right now, sorry. Uh, I, is that a second question or? No. No. Okay. Uh, Great. So I wanted to ask Vanessa, you, you mentioned in your the list of things early on in your talk that, that should be considered. You mentioned thinking proximally about health, and I didn't quite understand what that was. So could you explain what you mean by that? Honestly, I don't know what I meant by that right now. Let <laughs> me just be honest. Um, I, I'm not reflecting. Um, I'm not recalling where I had that particular point, so I apologize. It sounded very, very good. <laughs> it, it did. It did. It made it, it made great. Uh, you know, it's because because to me, I, I might interpret it as as the health needs of the community that are that are primary to the community. But I could put any you know interpretation. But maybe you you know or you have some thoughts on that. I have that sentence on a couple of my slides. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, uh, uh, often, and, and unfortunately, uh, the Human Genome Diversity Project, the Thousand Genomes Genographic Projects are, are great, great unfortunate examples of this, in which researchers would enter into communities promising things like therapeutics will, will dis discover the thing that is causing, for instance, the NIH NADDK made a similar promise to the Otham peoples like in 1965, we're going to treat diabetes, and then leave, not telling, disclosing that maybe the, the, it'll take a long time for these interventions um, to actually be translated back to their health. And meanwhile, community members are wondering what happened, where'd you all go with our data? So um, that's what I meant by thinking more proximally um, in, in terms of the promises, messages, engagement, et cetera. George? Thanks. Uh, th this has really been a terrific session. And as I reflected on the values and the principles that you mentioned, I was reminded of um, a major principle that we learned as part of the NIH-wide Community Engagement Alliance, particularly during the COVID era, was the issue of trust. And we, we think we know when trust is enriched or when trust is eroded, but from a research perspective and in your experiences, do you have objective ways of assessing trustworthiness? I mean, we, we, we definitely want to be trustworthy and we want to do everything possible to get there, but how, how do you measure that? And, and what have you found useful from a research perspective in answering questions about trust? If I might go first, um, within, let's say, the organization that I had worked for, South Central Foundation, there was a requirement, a research requirement, that researchers were to put forward their concept in a concept proposal, a one-pager. Um, so they could submit, let's say, their specific aims page, as well as a, a cover page, saying this is what my intention is and why we think that we'd like to partner with this agency and, and here are the outcomes of interest and the procedures that might be used, you know, again, very broadly. I would say presence or absence even of the request is an indicator of trust. Um, we had many re researchers that once they discovered that that was a requirement, pre-approval, they were out. Not interested in participating, not interested in partnering. So just to get presence or absence to engage in a process um, that's community-led would be a, a very Low bar, one might think, but it's an indicator. There's an emerging field of equity metrics. We keep talking about equity, how do we measure it? That's actually a very interesting question. Some of this is rooted in health e economics. I have a concern that health economics is really short term um, and also may substantiate uh, systems of that are incongruent with actual community health. But that is a starting point. Um, in terms of tracking whether or not we as researchers are delivering on the promises that we have made, 
Um, one way to do this is tracking but, uh, research dollars into communities. So for instance, um, with Indigidata, which is an Indigenous Data Science Education Workshop that I started, we actually shifted all of our uh, research capacity and training outside of universities into tribal lands. So we're funneling outside dollars um, from NSF and also um, philanthropic orgs. And we, other than paying for, or not paying for airlines, everything else goes to tribal nations at a rate of 67%. Uh, that is something that we, 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 we is like above the standard of other types of training opportunities that have federal sponsorship in some, for, in some form. We can do this with similar other types of, of grant mechanisms when we start tracking where are those indirects going, the, where are those directs going, who are we actually training, et cetera. And again, also aligning that education is not the same as engagement. Thank you. Reps, could I have a quick follow-up from Vanessa, please? Because something she said actually just triggered a, a reflection. You know, very often when we put out a, 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 a notice of funding opportunity, we don't always do it, but sometimes we ask for a letter of interest. So did what you say apply also to letters of interest when before we even ask you to come in with an application? Yeah, so um, le let me just step back. Um, the process that I was engaged in with the tribal leadership of South Central Foundation, which gets their tribal authority from the Cook Inlet region, um, began with a concept proposal phase. Um, and then if approved, the researcher and their team would, and this was also true of those of us that were embedded within this health system. So it wasn't a, they do that and we do something else. No, every single researcher, uh, student as well, uh, would complete the concept proposal phase that goes all the way to the board of directors. Um, if approved, then uh, the person was, uh, would move forward in partnership uh, to develop a full proposal. And then after that had been um, written and approved, it would, that full proposal would go back through a full process now once everything was in hand um, in the way of this is what the engagement would look like, this is what our recruitment flyers and materials would look like, these are our research team members, ad nauseum, this, you know, on and on, uh, these are the actual measures. Um, then um, at that point, then that's when there would be a suggestion of, of moving forward with funding. Funding application. I, so I again, we'll, this is a, a really uh, detailed manner in which uh, engagement would occur, where there would be a hand, and this required is how um, that group had chosen to have a hand uh, in the development of the research question, the processes, the et cetera, et cetera, and embedding that information within the healthcare system. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. This has been a terrific session. Um, appreciate both the, all of the panelists and the presenters as well as the questions. And I feel like I need to summarize it, but at great peril here, because um, there's so much to be talking about. But uh, first and foremost, I think the, one of the most important things I heard is the importance of building trust with the, with the communities that you work with. Uh, second, I think I heard, we, we use the word engagement a lot, but that engagement's not enough. We really need, uh, building on trust, but we need to really think about true co-creation from the beginning of the project. Um, I also heard that I think we need to recognize the need to have a different view of what community leadership means, um, because the community may not always have the same educational opportunities and the same uh, socioeconomic opportunities that um, the, the traditional academic community does. So I think that's something uh, that was important. Um, I also heard the importance of uh, recognizing marginalized communities uh, that are not only marginalized, but don't even have a voice at the table, uh, which uh, some are fortunate enough to have. And, and so I think we've heard the need uh, in the context today that we really do have a lot of work to do in terms of thinking about making sure our databases include 
all participants, all humans, uh, and make sure that we have a commitment to doing that. And I think I will stop there, but I'm sure, George, do you have anything else you'd like to add to that? Not, not a whole lot, Rex. I think you did a terrific job, uh, only to highlight the importance of the principles and the values and the terms that um, Vanessa mentioned. I think trust is, is in there. But the second thing was also many of the challenges that traditionally in our NIH funding we haven't paid attention to in working with community partners or working with, uh, I think it's a little different for sovereign entities, but uh, really rethink how we fund and how we support particularly small community-based organizations and small partners. And I think the final thing I wrote was paying attention to the power imbalances we may not think of them that way, but we, we have our structures and we go through with our structures, but may, they may really reflect serious power imbalances that go against meaningful community engagement. But this has really been a truly rich, rich dialogue. So thank you all. Thank you all. And, and uh, I will just say, I, I think all of us that work with participants in general regardless of where they come from, should put a copy of that ladder on uh, in front of our uh, desks. Great, so, so that, thank you very much to everyone. Let's give them a round of applause. And thank you very much for sticking it out to the, the bitter end here um, of today. We have tomorrow, um, and we'll start it at uh, nine o'clock with the session, 8.30 with breakfast. Uh, no, nope. I'm so sorry. So this is why I have my friends here. Yes, so, so 8 for breakfast, 8.30, 8 for, for the session. Thank you very much. Goodbye.